Welcome to the media ministry of Argyle United Methodist Church. Today's sermon is given by Rev. Corey Knott. Today we continue our sermon series, Learning to Fly, Preparing Your Kids for Life. Can I sleep at the class keys when I stay late at school? Shortly after we left, my mother told me of another decision she had reached. I would no longer go to the private school. No! 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 You can't do that to me! You can't do that to me! No! You can't do that to me! This... You see now. You, you ruined everything! You ruined everything! This ruins my life! You ruined everything! I will never Te prometo que todo you. estará bien. Vamos. No! Vamos no! Now. It'll never be all right. You're wrong. This is exactly what I was worried about. I will never be able to forgive you. Nunca te perdonaré. Nunca. I have a scholarship and nobody gives this up. The 1.3 miles from the Klasky house to our bus stop was the longest walk I'll ever know. I had publicly scorned my mother. And yet she had not reacted. What did spark our climactic moment was my use of a common American phrase. Not right now. I need some space. Not a space between us. In the midst of confrontation, she found clarity. She expressed regret that she had to ask me to deal with the basic question of my life at such a young age. And then she asked it. Is what you want for yourself? To become someone very different than me. been overwhelmed by your encouragement to apply to your university and your list of scholarships available to me. Though, as I hope this essay shows, your acceptance, while it would thrill me, will not define me. My identity rests firmly and happily on one fact. I am my mother's daughter. I don't know how many of you have ever had that experience where there was a pivotal moment in your life where you had to correct or inform a child that their wishes were not going to be met and they lost it. Uh, maybe many of us have lost it over the years. And today we're going to talk about this idea of, of discipline. And now I want to call your attention to something that when most of us hear the word discipline we immediately think of that phrase well now you've done it now I'm going to have to discipline you as if discipline is a form of punishment really discipline is much more than punishment uh, it is correction it is encouragement discipline involves training 
providing opportunities for your children to be challenged and to grow through uh, growth barriers. And so today we're gonna talk about this idea of how we discipline through encouragement and correction. And before we do that, we're gonna spend just a few moments talking about obedience and what obedience ought to look like in the home. I think you'll find today, and I've had many people share this with me over the last couple weeks, that although this is particularly related to parenting, I think you're gonna find today's message applicable at any stage in your life when it comes to obedience, to hearing and answering the call of God on our lives, and how God, I think, works with us through encouragement and correction in our own lives. If you've got your Bibles with you this morning, I invite you to turn to Hebrews chapter 12. And I want to encourage you guys to bring your study Bibles with you each week uh, to the services. The reason why I say that is because uh, you may want to write down something or highlight something. I, um, one of the greatest treasures and gifts uh, that I look forward to uh, one day is, is to, um, to be able to, to give my study Bible to, to my children. Um, that, that, you know, I don't know that it will be very valuable. You know, it's not like John Wesley's study Bible or anything like that. Uh, but just some of those notes, um, Jennifer's got a study Bible that she had when she was in college, and it's neat to go back through there and see some of the things that you were thinking when you read a particular passage. So again, I want to encourage you, uh, bring your Bibles with you every week to church and, um, and uh, take advantage of the opportunities to write little notes to yourself and uh, follow up. Uh, and believe it or not, it's not sacrilege to write in your Bible. I know some of you may have thought that growing up. All right. We're going to read Hebrews. Uh, Paul writes to a church that is in struggle, that is in pain and conflict, and has had a very difficult uh, season that they're working through. Paul writes, And you have forgotten that the word of encouragement that addresses you as sons, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have had all human, have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while, while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time. Indeed, it's painful. But later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. I want to I wanna just say this. Parenting is hard work. And you know what? Growing up is hard work. Learning how to live within boundaries having expectations that aren't met and then trying to overcome obstacles in our lives. All of these things make for difficult times. But think about this, whether it was a coach or a teacher or a parent or some mentor in your life, most great things come with hard work. Most great things in our lives come with hard work. But I also wanna remind you of this. Not only is it hard, parenting ought to be edifying. And 1 Corinthians, Paul also writes that love edifies and builds up. Our goal as Christian parents ought to be to build up our children so that one day they become men and women who follow after the heart of God. Right? That's our goal. That's our goal as parents, is that our children would grow up and they would follow, hopefully, in the ways that we have led. Now, here's an interesting thing, and you saw this in the video clip. One of the fears I think we have as parents, especially during difficult times, was when the mother asked her daughter that question, is your greatest fear that you would somehow end up like me? And there may be some parents here this morning that, that that is a real fear. Maybe you don't feel like you've lived up to what you had hoped to be, or maybe your experience growing up wasn't very good, and, and so you've tried to be very different from one or both of your parents. My hope and my prayer would be this, that we would know this morning that there is no such thing as a perfect parent. All right, let me liberate you on that. There is no such thing as a perfect child. And that I think what God desires from us all, whether we are parents or children, grandparents or grandchildren, aunts or uncles, or just adults that work with the young people in our community, God just wants us to be faithful and to try to raise up a generation, dare I say generations, 
who would seek after the heart of God. Now I wanna talk just briefly, before we get into this idea of discipline, what is obedience and what does it look like? You guys have heard me talk about this before and use this little phrase that we talk about in our home, that obedience has to meet three criteria for it to be considered obedience. If it doesn't meet these three criteria, then I would call it disobedience. The first criteria is this, that when we ask or request that a child or someone do something, that we expect it to be done immediately, right away, all right? This is how I operate with the staff here at the church. I ask Joe or Nathan or Liz, I say, hey, I really want you to do something. Uh, Most of the time, I'm really hoping that they'll do it. All right, it's not just a suggestion. Now, sometimes I'll make suggestions, but Nathan knows this. There's every once in a while, there's an occasion where I'll say to Nathan, I'll look him in the eyes and I'll say, man, I need you to do this. And Nathan understands, hey, I need him to do that. And and 99% of the time, they're, they're happy to do it. Now, here's the problem. Most of us like to do things on our time. I'll eventually get around to doing what I'm being asked to do, especially when we don't want to do it. We will delay or drag our feet to show what? I just want you to know I don't agree. None of us do that, do we? None of us do that with a supervisor at work, I'm sure. I'm sure we don't do that. None of us do that when God's calling us to action. I want to share with you a story that speaks to this idea or this concept of first-time obedience. It's a story that you've probably heard before, but I bet none of you would have ever thought to connect it to first-time obedience and raising children. The story is of a young boy named Samuel who is given by his mother at about 12 years of age over to the high priest and the judge, Eli, to teach and to train, to bring him up in the Lord. This mother made a promise when when Samuel was born that she would raise her son to follow the Lord. And so she sent her boy uh, basically to parochial school, if you will, or uh, what I would call the Jewish school. And uh, the boy's name is Samuel. Here's this story. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions But one night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, here I am, and he ran to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call you. Go back and lie down. And so he went and lay down. Again, the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call you. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called, Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls you, say this, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and laid down in that place, in his place, and the Lord came and stood there, calling as the other times. Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Now, parents, I want to give you a picture and ask if any of you would like to see this happen in your home. Let's, let's say, for example, you live in a two-story home and you are on the first floor in the kitchen and you holler upstairs, for example, in our home, Taylor, Taylor, and then you listen for just a moment and you hear, speak now for your servant is listening. <laughs> oh, would that be glorious, <laughs> right? Your 17-year-old comes running down, speak now for your servant. is. I tried to incorporate this in a staff meeting a few weeks ago. Nobody was going to have that. I share this story with you because even though we would never make the connection, this is a perfect example of first-time obedience, responding when we hear our name called. Let me ask you a question. What if... What if, like Samuel, this was our response when God came calling? How much more joyful would our lives be if when God prompted our spirits, when God asked us to do something, when God challenged us or moved in us, 
that we reacted as Samuel did and came immediately into the presence of God and said, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. How much more pain and suffering would we avoid in our lives if we would just respond to God in this way? Friends, it is important for us to teach our children to respond to our authority and our call in such a way because it will prepare them and put them just another step closer to them responding that way when God calls. You ever thought about that? That your parenting is related to how your children will perceive God and respond to God's calling in their lives? If you demonstrate that, and so let me ask you a question to the parents. How are we demonstrating that to our children? Are we responding quickly, immediately, right away uh, when God is calling us, moving us to give or to volunteer or to step out in faith or to reconcile or to reach out, whatever it might be, uh, what is our response? When you ask your child um, or speak to your child in a way that requires an answer, you need to expect an immediate response. They must say something like, yes, mommy, yes, daddy, I'm, what do you need? All right, it's important that we respond. And I wanna, I wanna say this, uh, students of all ages, I think when our parents, I, this is good for husbands too, you know, when our wives, when our spouses say, hello, you know, I, I know none of you have ever done it, you acted like you didn't hear. Any of you ever acted like you didn't hear? You know what, I know my mom's calling, it's time for dinner, but I'm on lap three of Mario Kart, I can just finish this, right? I didn't hear, right? You turn up the volume a little bit more. Uh, that's disobedience. That's disobedience. The second aspect of obedience is that we do what we're asked completely. All right, and there's a story I wanna share with you. A story that Jesus shares in the Gospel of Matthew. He's talking to a crowd that is gathered. He says, what do you think? There was a man with two sons. He went to the first son and said this, son, go out and work today in the vineyard. I will not, the son answered but later he changed his mind and went to work. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, I will go and work. But he did not go. And Jesus asked the crowd, which of the two did what his father wanted? The one who completely followed what the father had want. Parents, never give a command unless you intend for it to be obeyed completely. Say what you mean and mean what you say. Right? Your children will actually thank you for it because they'll understand what the expectations are. The most frustrating thing for a child or a young adult or a teenager is to not know what the expectations are. When you're in college, we got some college students, congratulations, by the way, that are graduating this year. All right, What's the first thing a college student wants when they go to their class on the first day? They want the syllabus, right? They want to know what's expected of them. Parents, give your children a gift by being clear with them. Let them know uh, what you need them to do and want them to do. Child obedience is directly related to parental resolve. Let me give you an example. How many, I know none of you have said this, right? By the time I get to three, you had better or else. What usually happens? One, two, and then on three, what do they do? They do it. Well, have you ever thought of this? If you can train a child to respond on three, then you can train a child to respond on one. They are responding not to your numerical counting, but to your resolve. They know when you get to three, you're serious. Why not teach your children you're serious the first time? Do you think God's serious the first time he calls us? Or do you think, oh, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just testing it out to see if the lines of communication are open. I'm not serious until I've called them a third time. What does that look like in our homes? And here's the third one. Obedience is only obedience if it is without challenge or complaint. And so if you're writing these down, the three are immediately, completely, and without complaint. Right away, you guys have heard me say this, do you remember them? Right away, all the way and in a happy way. If we don't respond in all three of those ways, we're disobedient. Some of you think, oh, that's, that's harsh, man. I'd, I'd rather them do it, do it even if they're kicking and screaming. Some of you would say, but pastor, I came kicking and screaming to the Lord. Anybody ever felt that way? 
Well, I've seen people kick and scream their way to tithing. I've seen people kick and scream their way to, to go into Sunday school. I've seen many a suburban swerve in here at the last second on a Sunday morning, and there are kids, believe me, kicking and screaming on the way into church. But I believe God wants it to be much more joyful than that. Love edifies and builds up. Philippians 2, verse 14 through 17 says this, do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. What does that look like in the lives of our children? What does that look like in our lives that when God calls, we respond immediately, completely and without challenge or complaint? Right away, all the way, and in a happy way. Now, let's look at this idea now. We've, we've demonstrated or articulated what obedience looks like. All right, how do we get there? How do we teach our children to be obedient? Let me write this down. This is very, very important. This, this works in church life too. Train your children to the standard. Don't lower the standard for your children. Somebody could have said amen on that. Train your child to the standard. Don't lower the standard to your child. Thank you. I heard that from a kid. <laughs> Boy, it's going to be a tough week for you, sir. Because <laughs> now your parents know that you know, right? Friends, the worst thing we can do is lower the standards. Let me ask you this. Some Sundays you'll come in here and we may preach something that's a little uncomfortable for you, but let me ask you this. Would you want us to water down the gospel of Christ just so you could feel comfortable? How would you feel knowing that you were attending a church that didn't have high expectations of you as a member? That didn't expect you to be the best follower or disciple of Jesus Christ that you could be? How would you feel about that? If we just made it easy for you every week, would you really grow in your faith? Now, some of us, we get uncomfortable when the pastor requests that we do something. Sometimes, maybe we're in a group, and, and I, maybe this has never happened in your family, but somebody in our family will say, all right, who would like to pray? And then you hear crickets. Nobody volunteers to pray, and then finally, I mean, finally somebody goes, well, well I'll pray. I mean, isn't the minimum that we could at least pray in front of our family? I mean, I understand if I called on somebody to come up here and stand at the microphone. I mean, that, that could be scary. I'll confess to you, if you guys don't know this, I still get nervous before I preach. You know what? I think I should. I should be nervous before I preach because I am hoping and expecting in prayer and in study that when I speak, I'm speaking a word from God for the people of God. I ought to have a little bit of nerves when I step into this place, there comes a responsibility, right? Don't threaten and repeat to your children. Here's what it sounds like. I'm not going to tell you again. And then what do you do five minutes later? You tell them again. Jennifer says I preach like that sometimes that I say I'm not going to tell you again or this is going to be my closing illustration and then 20 minutes later I close. It is frustrating, it is frustrating for young people and it is frustrating for parents to have to threaten and repeat. Don't negotiate in times of conflict. You know what I'm saying? Any of you have a child that's a negotiator? Right, come on. An attorney wannabe, right? I mean, they're a negotiator. They're negotiating everything. I've got children that negotiate bedtime. I've got children that negotiate whether they're going to brush their teeth, just the top teeth. Maybe we won't brush the lower teeth, right? They want to negotiate everything. Don't negotiate. Let your children know what you expect. Mean what you say. Say what you mean. Finally, when your children are obedient or disobedient, remember the context, that which gives perspective regarding why a child might be behaving a certain way. It doesn't excuse the behavior, but it might explain it, all right? There could be a lot of stress going on in the house right now. 
Maybe somebody, some of you have lost jobs over the last few years. Maybe you're having a difficult time with your finances. Maybe there's been some relational trouble in the home. Sometimes children will act out when there are stresses around them and just not, doesn't excuse their behavior, but maybe there ought to be some context that you consider when you're dealing with, uh, with giving instruction. And then I love this. This is great for husbands, too. When you are giving an instruction, require eye contact and a verbal response. Jennifer says she always loves it when I give her a, reverb, a verbal response. It is, and she usually wants it to sound like this. Speak now for your servant is listening. <laughs> I mean, our marriage is great when I do that. Never been better when I do that. It's not so great when I'm watching Josh Hamilton hit another home run and then I have to ask Jennifer after she's been talking for five minutes, what, what did you say now? right? You will find if you'll just stop for a moment as a parent and stop and get the attention of your child and go ahead and give that instruction and ask them to look you in the eye and give you a verbal response, you will find that half your behavioral problems will go away overnight just by doing that, just by making sure that the expectations are clear. Again, what I wanted to remind you, children want to know what the expectations are. When they get in trouble, they want to know they deserved it. Not that they're just getting in trouble indiscriminately. Well, what did I do this time? I don't even know what I did. Make sure they understand. All right, discipline means that we have an ongoing relationship. And so what I want to tell you is that we don't just train our children for a couple years and then stop. All right, we're going to talk about peer pressure and uh, teen abstinence and uh, alcohol and drugs and sex next week. And it isn't that we just have one conversation and then we check that off our list and say, all right, I had that talk when they were in sixth grade. Now I'm done talking about all these other things. Parenting is something, friends, you know this, you do this all the way through. And in some ways, you never really stop. Your relationship just changes. You're not exercising as a parent out of authority anymore. You're leveraging the relationship you have with your adult children. And those of you who have children that are now young adults, you know that. You're now training them based on what you instilled in their heart over the years growing up. Now, as we consider this idea of how we begin, what does discipline coin look like? What are the two sides? Encouragement, and correction. Let's look first at encouragement. There are some tools for encouragement. I want to lay them out for you. There are two types of, of things that we are training our children. I'll speak very briefly on the first. One is skills. The other is behavior. Okay, skills are those things that we're trying to teach our children how to do, how to hit a ball off a tee, how to swim, uh, how to clean up their room, you know, just things that they're learning how to do, how to brush their teeth, how to tie their shoe. Those are skills. They're not, more, they're not things that are ethical or moral, all right? How well you hit a ball is not an ethical or moral thing. It's a skill. And so when we're teaching skills, it's important for us to give verbal praise and goal incentives. And so, for example, we're teaching a child how to swim, uh, and they're struggling with that a little bit, then we may say to the child, you know, if you will practice your swimming and you will learn how to swim to the other end of the pool, uh, we'll get you those new pair of goggles that you want. All right, that's not a bribe. You're just incentivizing what you're doing. Some of you with parents, uh, you'll say, listen, if you will uh, bring those grades up, uh, then we'll get that phone that you've been interested in, in getting. Or you may give the phone back. Now, some of you are going, wait a minute, time out, that's a bribe. No, there are some goals that we might want to incentivize. Now, here's the balance. Here's the balance. If a child is at a certain level academically, and then you recognize that they are dropping because of their lack of effort, all right, then we're not talking about goal incentivizing, all right? Now we're talking about behavior. They are choosing not to employ their time wisely or, or focus their attention on their academics, and then we look at removal of privileges, all right? But just think, I wanted to separate this idea of skills, things that they're learning how to do that don't have any ethics or morals involved. Uh, now let's look just at behavior, there are two times we train when we're discussing behavior, pre-activity and post-activity. So let me give you a great example. Say you have a young child that's about five or six. They're learning how to talk. They're, they, they, they're learning how to kind of interact with people. They're learning how to kind of have interpersonal relationships. And so you want to teach this child when you come into church and someone tells them that they look nice. 
oh, you look really nice today, little Susie. You look great. What do you want? What is the bare minimum you want that child to say to the adult? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and so how many of you, I know your parents have tried this. You were training them. Maybe you had your grandchildren with you. You're training them. You're talking all the way to the church. Now, you've got a pretty dress on today. It's Easter Sunday, and somebody's gonna tell you how pretty you look, and what are you gonna say when uh, Pastor Corey tells you how nice you look today at church? What are you gonna say? And they'll say, I'll say thank you, Pastor Corey. And so you'll do that, and then what happens? I'll come up, and I'll see your kids. Hey, you look great today. I'll try to give a high five, and sometimes what will happen with a child? They'll get in behind your leg, right? And they're real shy, right? And, and, and you'll want to say, oh, 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 she's just shy. We're, but here's what you're going to say, all right? You're going to say, I'm so sorry. Thank you so much for complimenting my child. We're working on this. And then what do you need to do when you get home? Work on it. Some guy at the early service said, work on it, baby. And I was like, no, 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 no. No, what I'm saying is this. We are called to work, friends, Parenting, good parenting is hard. It's hard work. Being a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ is hard work. It's not an easy road. Narrow is the road. Wide is the gate that leads to destruction, but narrow is the road that leads to life. Friends, very few, Jesus says, will find that narrow way. And yet that is what we're training our children to be, followers of Christ. Now, there are some things that you need to do with your kids when you're trying to encourage them. One is words of affirmation. Kids need to hear when they're doing a good job. Sometimes we focus too much on the correction. We're constantly jumping on them when they're doing something wrong. But it's important for us to catch them doing something good. Some of you parents, this is going to be a challenge. Jennifer and I were talking about this. We were having trouble with one of our children one time, and we'd said, we have just got to catch this child doing something good. You, know, you guys know what I'm talking about? So we were on stakeout, just waiting around every corner to listen, to hear this child say something kind to one of their siblings. Oh, great job. I mean, we just run right out. Sometimes a child is throwing a temper tantrum, especially with young children. They're throwing a temper tantrum, and you don't, maybe they're in their room for time out, and you don't want to go in there and have this conversation with, with them until they get their self-control. So you may have to just wait till they breathe. Ah! Oh, your, your self-control. Right, you may have to just catch them doing something good. Here's the amazing thing. When you verbally affirm a child and you also add physical touch, you give them a hug, it goes that much farther. You tell your child that you're proud of them. One of the greatest things I ever saw, and this guy's a young adult now, but there was a high school student when I first got here to the church and his father still would give him a hug in the church lobby and say, man, I am so proud of you, son. And this son wasn't too cool for school. I mean, this son would hug his father and kiss his father on the cheek. And I mean, that kid just beamed. As a young adult, that kid just beamed when his father told him he was proud of him and gave him a hug. Try that with your children. It will go so far. Now let's talk a little bit about correction. Some of you have been waiting for this. I want to, uh, give me the tools, pastor. Give me the tools. Know this, that there are certain periods of conflict in the life of a child. 14 to 40 months, all right? 14 to 40 months, 9 to 12, and 19 to 22. These are the biggest seasons of conflict. And some of you would say, pastor, really, it's uh, three months to 35. That's the season of conflict. We have some adults in our church who are still, honestly, struggling with adult children. Uh, that those adult children have just had so much difficulty or pain or something has happened that they are still parenting in some ways as if those adult children are teenagers. Talk about difficult, difficult seasons for some of them. All right? Uh, my hope and my prayer is that if you implement some of these things now, you may not have to be dealing with some of those things later in life. Now, there are... There are circumstances, that uh, difficulties that can come where we may, uh, may need to step in uh, and love our adult children through difficult times in their lives. Uh, but let's talk about this idea about punishment versus correction. Punishment is an appropriate con con consequence for an offense, but correction is the act of bringing back from error or unacceptable deviation from the standard. So remember, punishment or a consequence is something we do as a result of of disobedience, 
but correction is bringing them back. One of the most amazing things I remember hearing was last year, uh, one of the teachers of one of my kids said and told us, said, I just want all the parents in this class to know that every one of your kids is gonna get in trouble at some time or another. They're gonna have to change their color. They're gonna get a check mark by their name. They're gonna have to walk during recess. They're gonna have to write sentences. There's gonna be some sort of consequence for every one of your children at some point in this semester. There is no perfect child in my class. But this teacher said, here's what I want you all to understand. Whatever happens with a child, we want them to know, first and foremost, that whatever happens, there is an opportunity for reconciliation. Parents, here's what you need to understand. Whenever your kids get in trouble, whether you have to drop the hammer, you have to, you have to do something that is painful to you, you have to take away a privilege that you know, and they, are so, and they yell at you in the middle of the mall, and you're just, it, trust me, kids, teenagers, hear this. It hurts your parents when they have to pull back on you. They're not just sitting in the corner after they take your privilege away and going, <laughs> oh, this is so fun. Look at how he's suffering. <laughs> trust me, it hurts them. They don't want to do it. They would much rather allow you to do those things. They're pulling back because they love you. They're disciplining you because they love you. It's hard for you to see it, but someday you will call them and go, now I understand. Your grandchildren are terrible. That's what you'll say. That's what you'll say. Two guiding principles. We need to understand this. The type of correction depends on the presence or absence of the motive. Was this an accident or was this intentional? You guys understand? You know the difference? Was this an accident that the kid, was it childish or was it foolish? All right, and so when you're correcting them, you need to ask that question. Was this childish or was this foolish? And then secondly, punishment must fit the crime. Punishment sets a value on behavior. All right, if you underpunish, you're gonna send a message. If you overpunish, you're also gonna send a message. Now here's what I want you to, to think about and close with. And I'm really going to close. We talked about in week one that the whole purpose of our training is to define God to the world so that the world might find God. And one of the things we said is our, our clear goal as parents is to get to the hearts of our children. All right? And we talk about getting to the hearts of our children. What we're saying is this. We hope that when our child becomes an adult that we will, okay, that we will have taught them in such a way that when they are older, they will see others as precious and they will have hearts of servants, okay? That those are the two most important things we wanna teach our children, that they will see others as precious in God's eyes and treat them as valuable and loved by God and that they will have servant hearts. And if we would see that played out in their adult lives, we would say we had accomplished the bulk of what we'd hoped to accomplish as parents. We also want them to accept Christ as their Lord and Savior. I mean, I think that's what we'd all want as children. I mean, our mission starts at home, all right? Let me give you a story. We had a young man who graduated from Duke Divinity School yesterday. This young man grew up in this church. His name's Brian Wellborn. Some of you may remember that last name, George and uh, late Pat Wellborn's son, all right? He graduated yesterday from Duke Seminary, is a United Methodist pastor. I mean, this church should be very, very proud of that. I mean, this is a, a young man that grew up in this church, went to Sunday school, vacation Bible school, grew up in the student ministries, uh, went off to college, uh, answered a call to God uh, to be in ministry, has graduated from seminary now. He is going up for his commissioning, or the uh, graduation ceremony at the Duke Chapel, and he meets and starts having a conversation with the wife of the dean of Duke Divinity School, okay? And she gets to talking, and she knows that Brian is from Argyle, Texas. And so she mentions, she says, you know, Brian, you know my husband and I, the dean, uh, we lived in Argyle for a little while too. You knew that, didn't you? And Brian says, yes, I did know that you were uh, in Argyle for a while, that you were involved in Argyle United Methodist Church for a while, they were. And she says, yeah, but I don't, has the dean ever told you what our job was when we were at the church? And he said, no. She said, we were the custodians at Argyle United Methodist Church. 
Brian walked across the stage and Dean Hayes shakes his hand and hands him a diploma. And Brian says to the dean, he says, you never told me that when you were at Argyle, you were the custodian. And the dean said, you never asked. Friends, when our children grasp and understand what it truly means to be a servant, so much so that they would be willing, paid or unpaid, to be the janitor at a church, that that will begin a path. It may not end up as the dean of Duke Divinity School, probably one of our best seminaries in Methodism, but it will lead to a life that honors God because dare I say this, Dean Hayes' position as dean in God's eyes is equal to his position as the custodian. It is no greater in God's eyes. I might go so far as to say the position of the servant was greater. Friends, that's what we want for our kids. Amen? Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, it isn't easy to correct our kids. We have difficult decisions to make, and we make a lot of mistakes along the way trying to encourage and, and correct our children. But Lord, we are not alone. Remind us that we have a church family and friends and neighbors, relatives who can partner along with us, children's ministers and a youth pastor. Lord, we have a youth pastor and a children's pastor at this church that absolutely love our children. Young adults that work with our kids in Zone 56 and in the nursery. Let us partner with these adults so that we might raise our children to honor and glorify you, that they might have servant hearts and realize just how precious others are because each and every one of us is precious to you. Lord, if, if we feel we've made too many mistakes, remind us through your love and grace that it's never too late to turn back to you, to be reconciled unto you, and to move forward in our journey of faith. In Christ's holy name we pray, and together we say, amen. Thank you for joining us today. For more information, please visit our website, argyleumc.org, or contact our office at 940-464-1333. Now, may the grace, mercy, and peace of God be with you. Amen.